He did not finish the conversation we had. He said, what songs would go with cremation? I said, I haven't the foggiest clue. He says, I'm gonna sing Light the Fire. <laughs> That's when I knew we had problems at Valley View with our song leading crew here. If that is our closing song, we're gonna lose it. I, I, even the opening prayer guys, you know, let's listen to this sermon so we know how to apply to our life later on. I thought, you bet you'll know, you bet you'll know. I, I, I was just looking over this. I, Devin and Rachel Swindle are with us from Cersei, and, and he said, I'm coming Sunday night, what are you talking about? I said, you're not going to believe this, it's cremation. I said, well, I've never heard anything on that before. And Melissa was going, what are you doing this for? Uh, and, and it is a good question. I've never dealt with it before in, in a lesson, and, and every once in a while somebody would ask questions, whether, is it, is it okay? Because it just, I, I remember, I've done funerals for years, and until about... 10 years ago, I never had really anybody ask me about it. And then people started saying, is it okay? Is it okay? And I always assumed it was. And then a couple of members here at Valley View really struggled with it because they heard sermons or read stuff online where people uh, in scripture were cursed if they, uh, their bodies were burned. And, and they really, really wanted to know. And so I thought, well, after all this time, why not do a Sunday night sermon on cremation? I knew if I put it in the bulletin, we wouldn't have anybody here. But apparently... You want to hear something about it. And, uh, and then Paul had the latest wisecrack this morning. He said his wife is, she's going to, Kim's going to be cremated. He says that she wants one last attempt to be having a burning hot, a hot, a burning hot body, right? That's what she wants. Uh, something's wrong with Valley View. This, this humor that goes through here is terrible. Um, if people are wondering about it, I guess I need to say something about it once in a while. So that tells you that your questions are or suggestions that you give the preacher will be heeded at some point in time. Let me ask this. How many of you have already done some form of arranging on your, on your final uh, details of your funeral and you have entertained and will be cremated? Raise your hand. Would you be willing to share? Okay. How many could absolutely never let that be done to you or a loved one? How many, how many feel, you feel pretty strongly? That's the way Melissa is too. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's about 50-50 in here, it looks like. Uh, but I, I don't want to just answer this for what my taste is. I want to answer this uh, from what God has to say about the disposal of a, of a human body. For some of you, this has no interest to you. You may find this repulsive, and if you just need to leave, uh, feel free to do that. If for some reason this offends your a sensitivity or something, not just as an excuse to leave early. I mean, this, this is it, it just if it offends you some way. But you're going to be asked by people about this. And if you're one of those Bible-believing people and people know you know Scripture, they're going, to, they're going to want to ask you and be able to get an answer from you about what's a good biblical stance on this issue. I consider a little bit of a symptom as I read through the articles that these people brought me or mentioned to me, uh, I began to realize some of this is Bible interpretation. Some of these people who are talking about curse in the Old Testament are misreading the passage, uh, which is often the case. Uh, and we're going to look at some of those. So have your Bible handy. We're going to go in two or, three, two or three different places, actually several different places, and just be ready to go or, or, or get on your computer phone or whatever. Begin here with a definition. Here's a definition I'm using for cremation. It's the orderly and respectful disposing of a human body by reducing it to ash through fire. So you're hastening decomposition of the body. That's what cremation is. And I've always thought, well, that's just one valid choice among a number of valid choices that people have about how to dispose of this vessel that we are living in for a time. By far the most common example in Scripture of disposing of a body is burial. We all know that. But the examples and the recording that that's what God's people did do not make it a command for us. Do not make it a norm that we have to observe. Just an example is not binding. It has to be followed by some sort of instruction or, or command from God. And so just the fact that a bunch of people are buried does not mean that's what Christians must do. All right, let's start. Genesis chapter 47. First book of Scripture, you have Jacob who is preparing for his death, beginning verse 28. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the, uh, the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. 
And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, now if, if now I've found favor in your sight, this is Genesis 47, 29, put your hand under my thigh, it's a Jewish thing, and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. The only property in the land Abraham ever owned was a cemetery. And it was a precious thing in the sight of Abraham's family. So he says, I'm going to die here in Egypt, but I want you to promise me you'll bury me up there in Abraham's land. Carry me out of Egypt, bury me in their burying place. And he answered, I will do as you've said. And he said, swear to me. And he did. And, and Joseph fulfilled this command, uh, this promise he made to his father. So the Bible is describing how much Joseph or Jacob valued where he was going to be buried. And he wanted his family to be understand this. Joseph picks up on this, and you know this as well, because jo it kind of ends in, in Genesis that his bones were in a box, right? And he said, don't bury me here. When you go out of here 400 years from now, he knew this because of the prophecy of Abraham, I want you to take my bones and I want you to bury me in the promised land. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 19, they did just that with Joseph's bones. This was such a big deal to them, the, the burial ground and, and being buried with family. And so that was recorded by Scripture as being very precious to God's people. That doesn't mean it's a command. It means they believed in the promise that Canaan would be their land to own one of these days. If the example were binding, then every believer would have to be carried to Canaan to be buried. Surely you know that's not true. But the burying of a loved one in the proper burial ground as a way to honor how they lived their lives and they, they lived it by the family ethic is most evident in the kings. When a king died, it would say, and he was buried with his fathers in the land of, of David. Except those exceptions. Here's one of those exceptions in 2 Chronicles 21. This is talking about one of the kings, Jehoram, and it says he was 32 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem, and he departed to no one's regret. You know what that means? Nobody was sad he was dead. They hated him, really. And so they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. This was a slam on him. To not be buried with your fathers in the same tombs, that, was, that would have hurt his heart. It was a dishonor because he did not live his life well. The most important emphasis about all this was the evaluation of how the person lived and that determined where he was buried. It's the quality of his life that mattered that Scripture is recording. And so some people will come along and say cremation is a curse. And here's the number one example for them, Achan in the Old Testament. Achan took some of the stuff of Jericho when he wasn't supposed to. This is a terrible example because this is not cremation. This is total, total annihilation. God in his judgment against, Ab against Achan just obliterates him and his family, everybody knows, with fire, right? That is not cremation. That is total consumption. That was the cause of death. That is not, well, I guess the body did burn up, but that was the cause of his death. It wasn't something that was done afterwards. This is not cremation. And you can put in there Sodom and Gomorrah. You can put in there Nadab and Abihu. When they did something that transgressed the law of God, God rained down fire on them. That's not cremation. That's death. That's death with an exclamation point, with a little bit of shame sprinkled in as God was saying judgment upon them. Bodies were burned up, but it was a destruction of God's judgment, instantaneous. Same thing with Leviticus chapter 20. Same thing with Leviticus chapter 21. If a man takes a woman and her mother also, it's a depravity. He and they shall be burned with fire. And so there are some penalties in the Old Testament that required them to be burned with fire. Some of them were stoning, some of them were fire. And apparently fire was just a little extra impressive to let people learn just how devastating this was in the eyes of God. This would be behind Korah and his rebellion in Numbers 16. And it's also for us. Does anybody know of a New Testament warning about something very important to God? And he says, oh, don't forget, I'm a God of consuming fire. Does anybody know where this is? Next screen, Hebrews. Hebrews, New Testament now. That's us. That's us. This is our covenant, right? 
Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, because our God is a consuming fire. This is not, I'm not a campfire here where you warm yourself. This is a warning. If you do not take worship seriously and do this with reverence and awe, God will visit you in judgment. I am a God who is a consuming fire. So there are penalties like this. The only real curse we have as far as how somebody dies and is buried, cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. You know this one, right? Deuteronomy 21. It was a curse that belongs to you, but Jesus took it for you. So that's not really in this discussion either. But I want to point you out to one particular story in 1 Samuel 31, if you'll make your way there. I think it's on the screen, but you may just want to look at it. 1 Samuel chapter 31, which I think is a good uh, representation of why uh, people are selectively reading the Old Testament. This is when Saul and his sons died on the mountain. It says the next day, verse 8 of 1 Samuel 31, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off his head. And they stripped off his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the, to the house of their idols and to the people. It was a great blow to Israel, great pride for the Philistines. They put the armor, they put his armor in a temple, and they fastened his body to a wall in Bethshan. Nice little wall decoration of a king who's just been defeated. And there's his wall, there's his body hanging on this wall as an advertisement that Israel's been defeated. When the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead. This was a nation saved by Saul shortly after he became king and they felt very much allegiance to him ever since then. When they heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, notice what they did. All the valiant men arose, went all night, took the body of Saul and the body of his sons from the wall of Bethshan. They were dead and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. If it's a curse and it's a sin, wouldn't this be wrong? Wouldn't this be a travesty and a depravity in Israel? They burned the bodies there down to bone, and then they took the bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. You know why they did this? To prevent any further dishonor to Saul. They decided we're going to hasten decomposition to be able to bury him so that no one else can come and find his body and do anything of dishonor and shame to him. This was a way to hasten this so that he would not be dishonored in the sight of the nations and in the sight of Israel. And God seems to be pleased with it. At least there's no judgment rendered here. And sometimes God does want dishonor brought on things. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 23, Josiah is the king and he's getting rid of all the false worship of the land. And he uses a fire. He just stokes this fire, a great big bonfire. And he starts throwing stuff in it. Verse 4 of 2 Kings 23, he burns the vessels that are used for Baal worship. And then in verse 6, he, bur- he burns the Asherah, which had by this time had become an object of worship. The, the chariots of the sun, whatever in the world that is. The altar of Bethel. And then the bones of the false prophets. These prophets that led the people into false worship, they had their own special sepulchers there. And so what Josiah did was he took their bones out of their burial place and he burned them to nothing as a way to say to the people of Israel this is a dishonorable we are not to honor these kinds of people we are to dishonor them sometimes dishonor is appropriate and to express that they burned the bones of these kings or these prophets that were false The most common example for not doing this is in the book of Amos. I should probably have Devin get up here and tell us about Amos, but he's having a a bit of a vacation, so I'm not going to make him do that. But I may have him tell me what page it's on. Amos chapter 2. First couple of chapters of Amos is, is for these transgressions of these nations around Israel. And all of the transgressions when it's non-Israel or non-Judah are not law things, things written in the scriptures. They are things that violate the universal law of human nature and brotherhood that we should all know. And if you'll notice chapter 1, it's going to take you through a couple of these. Verse 3, 
Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, for four I will not revoke punishment. They've, they've filled up all I'm going to put up with them, but he only lists one real crime. And this one is, they threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. In their war, they didn't just kill people. They didn't just defend themselves, they tortured people. And there is a certain law of nature, law universally put into every human being. You may have to kill someone to defend yourself, but you do not torture and obliterate them in the heinous ways that Damascus did. And God said, that's enough, I'm going to punish you for this. Then verse 9, verse 6, both of these are because of ethnic cleansing. These people who just chose a certain nation of people and totally obliterated them from the planet. I'm going to get rid. I'm going to come after you because of you treating people this way. Then in verse 11, this one nation, we'll say, is Edom, right? Offspring of Esau. Pursued his brother with a sword and cast off all pity. And in his anger, he t tore perpetually and kept his wrath forever. He went after a, a cousin, a brother, actually, uh, God says. He went after family. And you don't do that. But I want you to notice chapter 2. He turns to Moab. Notice he says, for three transgressions of Moab, chapter 2, verse 1, and for four, I will not turn back my punishment because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. Moab, children of Lot, Edom, children of Esau, these are relatives. And you didn't, didn't just defeat him, he dug up the king. After he killed him and the king was buried or something, dig up the, the king's bones and he burns them to lime. And some, some scholars will say they put it in paint and they painted signs just to, be, just to be extra cruel and vicious with the message you want to send. This is not cremation once again. This is humiliation. And this is a violation of, of human dignity and respect for human life. It is not cremation he's talking about. These were already bones. That takes care of that one. It seems to me that this kind of gesture was so disgraceful to God and just basic human decency that he was offended and said, I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm not going to put up with this and turn my eyes from it. It's not the burning itself that offends God. It's what it's intended to mean. What is your burning intending to mean? If you are a person who wants to cremate somebody else, because you hate their guts and you want to turn them to ashes and rid the world of anything residue of them, that could be equivalent to this. That's not a good you know, motive for what you want to do. At the same time, if you want to bury somebody in a trash heap, put a bunch of trash on them, it's burial, but that would be wrong too because that's just degrading of human life as well. Now what I want to do with all this is draw some conclusions. First, how the dead are handled does matter. It does matter how you handle the dead. That says something about how you view human life. In the context of the ancient world, this was very clear. There are no passages that teach the burning of deceased human bodies is a curse or offense. But we do have plenty of passages showing that how the dead were treated did matter to the cultures of that time and to God himself. And we are the same. We need to care about what happens to the bodies of dead people. That's why a few years ago in your own state of Arkansas, the funeral home that had so many people frozen and laying out back, didn't have time to get them buried or disposed of properly. That's why that's repulsive and against the law. There's something nasty about that, something disrespectful about that, because it says something about how you view human life. How you treat the dead says something about how you view the living. There's a connection between this. And I think we all know it. So that when the military... You, they teach, they train that when they're somewhere and somebody is killed in action, they don't leave the bodies behind. They even risk their life for the sake of the body. I hope we never lose that kind of respect in our country. And when somebody finds whatever residue is left from a POW somewhere, they bring it back and give it an honorable, honorable burial because we view the sanctity of life as being communicated by how we, how we treat the dead. So when you have a loved one, as Tom Long recently said at Harding, when you have a loved one who dies, 
see them through respectfully all the way to the end. That says something about how you view human life. It doesn't answer what you do with a deceased body. But it does tell you it matters. Deal with it with respect and dignity. It wouldn't be wrong to do any number of things. But it's not what's done, it's why it's done and how it's done that matters and makes the difference to God. Jews seem to shun cremation because of Daniel 12 and resurrection. Early Christians seem to shun it because pagans practiced cremation. But these are just sensitivities to cultural people. Jesus was buried, but that doesn't mean you have to be. Jesus even says in John chapter 5 that when he comes down and he gives the voice, the, the, the people will come out of their graves to resurrection. But that doesn't mean that if you're not buried, you won't experience that resurrection. But how you treat the deceased human body does matter. Secondly, we're given absolutely no instruction from God about how to dispose of human bodies. All sorts of examples, no commands, no instructions about how to dispose properly with God's approval a human body. So God's not all that concerned with it would be my conclusion as long as you're not dis disrespecting human life by how you do so. We're told in Revelation chapter 20 that when judgment comes, Hades will give up its dead, so will the sea. It does not matter what happens to your body. God can re-resurrect it. Could, not re-resurrect. Could resurrect it. He can bring it back from whatever he wants to. I think of the worst ways to die. Eaten by wild animals is one bad one. I don't want that to happen. I don't like fire and I don't like drowning. I don't like much of anything. I just want to die in my sleep, I guess. I, I don't want to be dropped in boiling oil. Anybody else? I mean, there's all sorts of weird ways I don't want to die. But it really doesn't matter how I die. God's going to be able to resurrect that human body. I mean, he made it out of dust in the first place. He could do anything he wants with it. So those people fixated, well, if this happens to me, how will God, how will God, really? You're really wondering that? I mean, God's pretty capable of doing a lot of things. So don't worry about that part. We know that the dead, thirdly, decompose. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. That's Genesis 3. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 3. If you're in a grave, the body will decompose. If you were, if you happen to have been embalmed, it will take a long, long time. If you're burned or lost at sea, God's going to be able to put all that back together. But it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to decompose either way. So I called a, a coroner friend of mine and I asked him about all this. And here's his line, which I think is very important for you to know. Whether slow or fast, the end is the same. But here's what he ended up saying. You can go fast or you can go slow, but you're going to pay for slow. Y'all get that? You're going to pay for slow. Do the, all the embalming and the funeral and the burial. It's going to take 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But you're going to end up in the same place that that person who paid, you know, $600 for a cremation ends. You're going to end up the same way. You just decide what price you want to pay, right? That's really what he says. And I really think that's kind of the thinking that we should use. Final thing. We're told what God is going to do when he sends Jesus back. He will raise the dead back to life in a bodily resurrection. There will be some continuity between this body and the next one, but I don't understand that. A lot of discontinuity between this body and the next one, I don't know, understand that either. I know that we'll be we'll buried one, day, one way and raised another, and we'll have a body that is equipped to live with God for eternity, enlivened by the Spirit of God. I do know that. And that it's the return of Christ that triggers all this. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The voice of the Lord will be heard, and suddenly everything will be brought back to life. All people will be brought back to life, regardless of how they died. He will reassemble them in a new spiritual body that will last for eternity. I do know that. And that's a day that we can look forward to. To this I would add one further thought. A funeral process and what is done with the body of the deceased is really a cultural, personal issue. You live in a culture where you have to bury within hours they'll do that. If you live in a culture that is totally opposed to cremation, then don't. But as far as I can tell from where we live, the best I can tell is our culture is not a bit offended by this. It's a personal preference that you have. And you shouldn't let anybody 
make you think that you'll be cursed somehow if you let your body to be burned to be burned in decomposition it's an area of freedom that people have to choose consider the issue reach a decision for yourself and share it with whom you want to but if it's really a sensitive topic just don't bring it up like politics and religion right just don't bring it up whatever happens respect human life and demonstrate that by how you you treat the dead walk with them all the way to the end and if you choose this this is what's going to happen they're going to be placed placed on what is called a retort they're going to be brought into the cremation chamber where it's heated up to 1500 degrees and within three hours the body will break down into ashes and will be cooled enough to put it in an urn and today according to the coroner the most popular thing to do is either bury it scatter it and this is weird to me put in jewelry I don't understand that but he says that's the common things the important question to this entire thing is not what happens when the body's over. The important thing is what you've done in the body while you've been alive and the state of the soul when you die. And if you choose to cremate, be cremated, the most important thing is that when you resurrect, the fire stops. You don't want it to keep going. That's a terrible sign. Eternal fire's not for you. Make sure you've lived well, and it will not matter what, do, what, what happens to your body. You won't care, and as long as your loved ones respect it and treat it with dignity, it doesn't really matter. What matters is how you lived and what Jesus plans to do after that. And if you've got that arranged and taken care of, nothing else really matters. If there's anything you need to do tonight to make your life right, make sure your soul is right with God, whether it means repenting or whether it means coming to God for the first time through the blood of His Son and the waters of baptism, make it known as we stand and sing to encourage you.